Hi, it's Dwyer. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. It is Monday, April the 13th, 2020. Let's talk boxing. In an earlier video, I talked about a fight that I thought was one of the most important heavyweight fights in history, really, right? Certainly of the last 30 years. And that's Lennox Lewis's last fight of his career. It was against Vitaly Klitschko, who himself would go on to be champion for several years. In that video, and I know it's controversial, I've read the comments. I talked about how since Mike Tyson's loss to Buster Douglas, right? In my opinion, the three best heavyweights I've seen are Lennox Lewis, who held the belt for several years, Vitaly Klitschko, Ditto, and Tyson Fury, who beat Vladimir Klitschko when Klitschko was champion, right? Who recently beat Deontay Wilder. I understand. Tyson Fury today doesn't have the lengthy resumes of the other two guys, right? Fair enough, fair enough. But in terms of talent, when I look at Tyson Fury's feet, when I look at his ability to fight left-handed and right-handed, when I look at his ability to fight inside for a guy his height, when I consider his height and his reach and his ability to stay away from you for 12 rounds if he wants, that's what he did with Vladimir Klitschko. Then I have to say he's one of the best. He's on the very short list of the best of the last 30 years. Well, in this video, I want to draw your attention to another fight. Because believe it or not, since I made my earlier video, Mike Tyson in an interview made the statement that he didn't feel that he could beat Ali at his best. Right now, this is actually a several year conversation that I had. It was an ongoing conversation that I had with my father in the 1980s. Right, my dad was a Joe Lewis and an Ali man. Right, for the record, I don't know how Joe Lewis would be competitive against Ali because Lewis had slow feet through short punches. Ali's a taller man than you think, with a longer reach than you think. I think Ali in that fight could stay outside against Lewis, just like Tyson Fury stayed outside against Vladimir Klitschko, just like Roy Jones, unbeaten at the time, stayed outside against James Tony, who was also unbeaten at the time, right? Great legs give you a huge advantage. Well, let me disagree with Tyson. I'm also going to disagree with another fighter, George Foreman, who in interviews has said recently that he didn't want any part of Tyson, right? Styles make fights. Boxing's not linear. The fight I want to draw your attention to is a fight between two great fighters, in my opinion. Prime, January 1988, Mike Tyson. You see why Tyson was a great fighter. Don't confuse older Tyson with young Tyson. This is prime Tyson. And he's fighting one of history's more underrated heavyweights. When I was a kid, we all knew who the heavyweight champ was. And that man was Larry Holmes. Now, Larry Holmes was coming off of two losses hadn't fought for more than a year and a half. When he steps in the ring on January the 22nd, 1988, against Mike Tyson, right? Holmes himself talks about how he had to be talked into the fight by Don King, right? The Eastern assassin had saved his money, had made some great investments. He didn't need to come back. Don King talked him into fighting Mike Tyson, this fight is the closest thing we have to a fight between Prime Mike Tyson and Prime Larry Holmes, or Prime Mike Tyson and Prime Ali. Now, let me just say this. 
Holmes is 38. When you see the fight, you see why some historians feel that Ali would beat Mike Tyson. Right? In the first round, Larry, who's pacing himself, he's playing games. He seems to be channeling Bernard Hopkins. Right? In the first round, you notice Larry's just seeing what Mike has. He's seeing the angles of the punches. When Tyson runs in, Holmes, on demand, is able to tie up Mike. You understand that Holmes realizes that Mike Tyson only has a front foot. Tyson cannot win rounds on his back foot. Holmes understands that Tyson has to come in with hooks to land. Tyson's shorter. Tyson cannot stay outside, outbox you from the pocket and win rounds that way. Right? So Larry, in the first round, in fact, the first and the second round, is just watching Mike, and when Mike gets in close, Larry tries to land a haymaker at times, tries to land a straight right hand as Tyson's coming in because he knows Tyson has to come in. And then Larry, after throwing a haymaker, ties up Mike. Mike cannot keep his hands going. He's fighting a guy who was a dominant heavyweight champion. Right? Larry Holmes is very skilled in the art of tying up a younger fighter. So you notice Tyson is getting thwarted. He's getting tied up like he was tied up in the James Bone Crusher Smith fight. Right? It's a bit of a hole in Tyson's game that bigger men were able to have Tyson jump in the pocket and tie him up if that fighter was skilled at tying up an opponent and wasn't thrown off by Tyson's hyper-aggressiveness. Make no mistake, when the first round starts, Mike Tyson, who knew that Larry Holmes was a huge name in the 1980s, understand, it's debatable whether Michael Spinks won either fight against Larry Holmes, right? Tyson clearly is trying to make a statement. Larry Holmes doesn't survive the first and second rounds because Mike Tyson is lethargic. Far from it. Tyson's on his front foot. Tyson's trying to come in with hooks. Larry Holmes is tying him up. Larry Holmes is giving him something to think about. Occasionally, you'll notice Larry goes to his body. Right? Larry's trying to time a home run punch, but Larry's not moving away that much. Then we get to the third round, and it gets interesting. Larry Holmes against prime Mike Tyson. Leans forward. Isn't up on his toes most of the round leans forward, is prepared to see what Mike Tyson can do. Prime Tyson, from the pocket. So you'll notice Larry's leaning forward, Larry's trading with Tyson. Larry has Tyson's hooks blocked, right? One of the problems with Tyson is Tyson is reliant on hooks. But what you'll also notice is that Tyson has a spectacular upper body. He can move it, right? Larry Holmes cannot keep Mike Tyson at the end of a jab, right? And understand, that's shocking if you were raised during the Larry Holmes era. That's what Larry did every fight. Tyson is able to slip the jab repeatedly with head movement, right? Let me also say too, and upper body movement. Tyson is a master at distance. Now he's cat quick. He has reflexes he doesn't have when he gets out of jail. He's cat quick. And let me just say Tyson, who at times is just kicking up his legs. He actually starts doing leg tricks 
in the early rounds against Larry Holmes. But Tyson is able to decide when they engage. In other words, Tyson's outside and he looks at Larry. He's that fast, folks. He's looking at Larry. Then Tyson decides to jump inside, and on demand, he's able to jump inside on Larry Holmes. Right now, Holmes, of course, master at tying up Tyson when he's caught off guard. So sometimes Tyson jumps inside, and Holmes is able to tie up a hand. Right? Holmes is able to tie up Tyson and turn Tyson. But what Holmes can't do, and it's breathtaking, is Holmes cannot repeatedly keep Tyson outside with jabs. Because Tyson will take a step back, or Tyson will dive into the pocket. Let me also say that it's shocking. And I mean shocking. How fast Tyson is. Right? He is cat quick. He's much faster than Larry Holmes. I understand this is older Holmes. But he's much faster than Larry Holmes. So then we get to the fourth round. And in the first minute of the fourth round, Larry Holmes comes out on his toes. He's bouncing. He pops a few jabs. Tyson looks befuddled, quite frankly. I know the Ali crowd is going to point to that and say, well, gee, Ali could do that all day. Prime Ali. Right? Not 1970s Ali, but prime Ali. Right? The Ali who's 23, 24, 25, right? He's 22 when he wins the heavyweight title. Right? But just understand what happens after that. Tyson, who has a spatial dynamic to his game, then starts timing the jab. Finds a way to avoid it. Keep in mind, his upper body's on a swivel. Then Tyson starts jumping in, and the punch that Holmes has a problem blocking repeatedly, he gets knocked down multiple times in the fight, is Mike Tyson's right hook up top. Larry 6'3", around the same height as Ali, who Holmes was the primary sparring partner for. Understand, Holmes was part of the Ali camp. Right? Holmes is on the card for the Thriller in Manila. He's just on an undercard for that. Right? Larry Holmes had extensive sparring with Ali. He's around Ali's height. Well, understand, Mike Tyson had such great timing when he was a young guy in his prime that Tyson, from the outside, is able to just jump inside throw the hook, have it land up top. Larry goes down. Larry gets back up. Tyson, and this is important here, is patient, right? That's Tyson at his best. He hurts you, then he's walking into the pocket and chasing you, but he's not in a rush because he knew his punching power. So you have Larry Holmes backing up, doing a Tyson Fury, right? Trying to stick his hand out to get the distancing. And you have Mike Tyson just slowly walking into the pocket, trying to land more big shots, right? Tyson figures out that that right hook up top is his Sunday punch for this fight. So, of course, he drops Holmes two more times. Now, I believe, just based on the fights I've watched, that there might be no better heavyweight in history than the Muhammad Ali who beat Cleveland Williams. I'll concede that. You look at the film, the reflexes are such that Ali is standing right in front of a very heavy-handed guy. And Ali's just leaning back, having the punches whiz by his face. Then he's so fast that he's able to then 
used Williams' leverage against him and hit him with very quick-handed counters. Right? This is kind of like the second fight against Sonny Liston, the phantom punch. Only here, you see the punches. It's, it's the same thing. The big guy's trying to hunt down Ali, who's moving around the ring. Ali has the utmost confidence in the angles. Right? Knows he has the hand speed advantage. And then when Williams throws and misses, Ali just starts pummeling him. Right? Williams is coming forward. You can tell Williams is completely unprepared, just like Liston was for Ali's quick counters up top, right? Then, of course, Ali starts dancing around. Ali knows he's too much for the guy. He starts being a showman. You then realize, gee, slow-footed heavyweights would have no shot on it, right? Slow-handed heavyweights would have no shot on it. The guy's just too fast. The guy's just too spatial. He knows how to lean away from shots, right? Vitaly Klitschko had this gift too, where just an innate sense of where the punch is going to land. But styles make fights, right? As I see the world, you could be the best. You could be perhaps the greatest, right? The greatest of all time, the greatest, period. But certain fight styles are going to give you problems. Now, Ali had a very hard time with shorter guys. Right? Joe Fraser. Ali has a very hard time with Fraser. The second fight that he wins, he's doing an illegal move, pushing down on the back of Fraser's neck. When they fight legally, Fraser beats him decisively in the first fight, knocks him down at one point. And then, of course, in the thriller in Manila, Fraser mounts a comeback. They're both spent. It's just that Fraser only had one good eye, and that's the eye Ali busted up. Ali, Jimmy Young, in my opinion, he loses the fight. I know Ali got the decision, okay, whatever. But Jimmy Young's ducking under Ali's punches. Unfortunately, Dick, Jimmy Young at times is also ducking under the top rope. That hurt him with the judges. I agree. An argument can be made that when Ali corners Young and Young's ducking his head out of the ring, that was illegal and perhaps Young would have been hurt in those rounds. Okay, fair enough. But you understood that Ali did better, quite frankly, against bigger guys like Cleveland Williams, right? Then he did against smaller guys who could get under him. My dad, when I got home, I was away at school. When I got back home after Buster Douglas had beaten Mike Tyson, my dad, who for years was telling me that Tyson would not beat Prime Ali, sat down on the sofa, looked at me. One of the first things he said to me was, Buster Douglas's jab is nice, but it's not an Ali jab. Right? Well, let me just tell you, when you see Tyson on January the 22nd, 1988, against Larry Holmes, you realize that even Prime Ali might not have been able to land his jab against young Mike Tyson. Right, let's be real here. The Tyson that matters most is the Tyson of the 1980s. It's not the Tyson of the 1990s, who's already lost to Buster Douglas, who loses twice to Evander, and who loses to Lennox Lewis, who pushes him a lot of the fight. Should have been flagged for that by the referee. Right, no, no, the Tyson we talk about as one of the great 
heavyweights in history, and you knew it at the time. Here's the Tyson who fights Larry Holmes. Now, I'm not saying this is prime Larry, right? Larry, who at one point was something like 49-0, and 0, had lost two fights in a row going into this fight. He'd also been off for more than a year. But Larry Holmes still had an excellent jab. And he cannot land that jab with any kind of regularity against this Mike Tyson. I believe Ali, who had a problem with shorter guys, right? Especially shorter guys with great hooks. Joe Fraser's left hook lands repeatedly against Ali. First round of the fight, their first fight. Ali gets hit with it so many times that he actually starts, you know, shaking his head to the crowd to let the crowd know, hey, that punch didn't hurt me. In other words, the punch landed, right? Trust me, that punch started hurting Ali later. Well, Mike Tyson is a two-handed version of Joe Fraser. Now, Joe Fraser, like Tyson, had a great upper body. He's a little bit more structured, right? His trainer was Eddie Futch. You need to remember that name because Eddie Futch goes on to train Riddick Bowe. Well, let me just say this. Another champion who, quite frankly, on his best days was terrific. Well, let me just say this. While Joe Fraser had to bob and weave to get his way in, Mike Tyson, young Tyson's a bit more complicated, right? Tyson, you'll see it in the Larry Holmes fight. Tyson can stand there and look at you, right? Tyson had the spacing where Tyson could look at you and know he's outside of your jab. Then, cat quick, he would bounce, right? Not constant bob and weave, but he would bounce, get under your jab, slip deep inside the pocket, and be there to hit you with either withering body shots or hooks up top. So while I privately believe the Ali who fought Cleveland Williams, and that's when Ali's on a run in the 60s, one of those years, he actually has Ring Magazine release an article where they say, we would have named Muhammad Ali our fighter of the year, but because of, because of his taunting of Ernie Terrell, right? Ali says to Terrell, what's my name? What's my name during the fight, right? And because of Ali's draft situation, Ring Magazine told its readers that it was not naming a fighter of the year. It would have named Ali, but for his lack of sportsmanship. Right? Ali's on a historical run in the 1960s. I agree, that might be the best heavyweight in history. I think skill-wise, that's what we have to fall back on. He has the best legs up until that point in heavyweight history. Right? Guys like Joe Lewis aren't going to touch him. Back in the day, they thought Jersey Joe Walcott had great legs. Jersey Joe, the referee who blows the phantom punch fight, right? Jersey Joe didn't have Ali's legs. Ali had great legs. Ali had probably the fastest hands in heavyweight history up until that point. But hell, I'd, I'd say up until today. Ali was elusive. But let's remember, he's dropped by Sonny Banks. Let's remember, he's dropped by Henry Cooper. Angelo Dundee has to use some taping on the gloves trick to buy time to allow Ali to clear his head. I do believe, based on styles, that Mike Tyson, circa 1988, had a chance to beat Ali of the Cleveland Williams era. Right? I think Tyson is a better fighter than Joe Fraser, right? Tyson devastating power with both hands. 
a little bit less scripted than Joe Fraser, could see out of both of his eyes, wasn't blind in one eye, which the public during the Fraser era did not know. By the way, we know Joe was blind in one eye because Joe himself has admitted it now. Right? Ali's targeting his good eye. In the thrill in Manila, I believe Ali knew Joe was blind in one eye. But, let me add an addendum to this. I believe there are many who have had great careers in the sport. I believe Lennox Lewis is one of them. Who, after they retire, they feel they owe a debt to the sport of boxing. They look at the guys in the sport who have tried hard, who have established themselves, who are big names and stuff like that, and they want to be courteous and diplomatic. That's why I feel that Lennox Lewis said that the toughest opponent he fought in his career was Evander Holyfield. Right? Holyfield is a fighter's fighter. He fights Riddick Bowe three times. He fights Mike Tyson twice. He fights Lennox Lewis twice. Right? He was unified at cruiserweight. He fought Ricky Parkey. He fought Dwight Braxton. Right? You uh, look at Evander Holyfield and you say, wow, you know, this guy... Had a career. He fought Nikolai Valuev when he was champion. Beat him, I thought, but got robbed. Right? You look at Evander and you say, hey, he had a great career. So I think Lennox Lewis deep down knows that Vinley Klitschko's the better fighter. Right? That the Ray Mercer fight was tougher than either Evander Holyfield fight, but I think he wants to tip a hat to Evander Holyfield. I think he wants fight fans realizing the dedication that Holofield put into the craft, right? Well, I believe George Foreman is Lennox Lewis Sr., right? Foreman, in an interview, says, oh, I, I wanted no part of Mike Tyson. Let me be clear on this. In the 1970s, Foreman was an absolute terror. Look at the Kenny Norton fight. He gets tested by Ron Lyle. Revisit that fight. Foreman's walking through guys. Foreman hit hard. Both hands. Foreman had no problem with explosive smaller fighters. So we all might remember his first fight against Joe Fraser. Folks, there was a second fight. I believe it was in Nassau Coliseum. George Foreman destroys Joe Fraser a second time. Multiple knockdowns, same deal. Right, understand, Dwight Braxton, right? Changes his name, Dwight Cowie. Absolute terror, right? The Camden buzzsaw. Shorter guy, big puncher. Love taking out bigger guys. You knew that Dwight Cowie was not going to run from you. Didn't matter. Didn't matter how big you were. George Foreman destroys him. Right? Foreman also had a defense where he would cross his hands and stuff like that. Foreman wanted to invite guys into the pocket to try to go to his body. Foreman also is more physical than a Larry Holmes, right? Understand, Larry ties up Mike, repeatedly ties up Mike. We know Tyson can be tied up. Looking at Larry Holmes' work, looking at the entire Bone Crusher Smith fight. Well, George Foreman's that guy who would tie you up and would lean on you. Lennox Lewis is the same way, right? These are guys who tie you up and lean on you. So you know how much George weighs, right? George understood that a lot happens in boxing between the punches. You would see Foreman fights and guys were just wilting, getting linked on by George Foreman. 
in my opinion, the George Foreman who takes out Kenny Norton. That's the fight to look at. It's Foreman after the Fraser fight. Right? The guy who takes out Kenny Norton. I think he would have a shot on Prime Mike Tyson. Understand, we talk about which fighter is better and stuff like that. The big secret in boxing, it's not really a secret, but it's what it is, is that styles make fights. You could be a great fighter like Thomas Herms and get beaten twice by a Rand Barkley. Right? Certain guys, for whatever reason, have the key to your safe. Know how to beat you. Have their styles mesh with your style. Right? George Foreman, and I know Foreman has a lot of respect for Mike Tyson. They're both part of the same fraternity. Menacing, tough, heavyweight champions. Right? I think Mike Tyson is made for George Foreman. Understand. Foreman wasn't just a puncher, he's a master boxer. One of the best jabs I've seen. Look at his defense, that Archie Moore stance, right? Catching punches and stuff like that. Foreman's a guy who can stand in front of you, catch punches, very hard to find his head. Let me also say this too. Boxing really does at times come down to seconds. Comes down to judgment. Not necessarily the fighter's judgment. Now, the Rumble in the Jungle is one of my favorite fights. It's a big moment in boxing. And it's true. George Foreman is very tired when he hits the canvas. There's no question about it. Right? You can tell it's hot in Africa. You can tell Foreman is tired. These are the days of 15-round heavyweight fights. They still had a few rounds to go. Foreman hits the canvas. Now, what I want people to do is to go back and look at the tape. I'm just telling you, Foreman beats the count. If it's Jack Reese, the referee in the first Tyson Fury Deontay Wilder fight, George Foreman would have been allowed to continue. Now, I agree. Ali was in much better shape than Foreman at that point of the fight, right? At that point, you get the feeling Ali, who could throw flurries, right? Who knew how to look good for judges. Ali could have opened up on Foreman. Foreman was a big time puncher, but he was bone tired, right? Power dissipates over a fight. Foreman may have been too tired at that point to really handle Ali. Foreman famously falls down against Jimmy Young, who beats him. Right? Foreman's fatigued at the end of the young fight. Foreman had stamina problems. Right? But understand, Ali never gives George Foreman another shot at the title. Right? Foreman, an argument can be made for a several year period. Keep in mind, Joe Fraser never comes close to beating George Foreman. Never. Right? Kenny Norton actually becomes champion in the latter part of the 70s, a guy who Foreman destroyed. An argument can be made, especially if you live through that era, that for a several-year period there, in the 1970s, George Foreman was the best heavyweight on the planet. Right? Ron Lyle, nobody wanted to fight Ron Lyle. Foreman does hit the canvas against Ron Lyle, but he takes Lyle out. Foreman's fighting tough fights during the 1970s. Well, let me just say, based on styles, while I think, and my dad, rest in peace, would disagree with me, right? <laughs> my family had a big Ali, you know, uh, shadow on it, right? Uh, while my dad feels that Ali would have beaten Prime Mike Tyson, if it's Prime Ali, right? I personally feel that Mike Tyson would have a shot on Ali. Right? I don't know how the fight turns out. I think Tyson would have a very good shot on Ali. I also feel George Foreman, prime George Foreman, would have had a very good shot 
on Prime Mike Tyson. Right? It's a shame that when Foreman came back, the stars didn't align. And we weren't treated to the hardest hitter of the 70s against the hardest hitter of the 80s for the heavyweight championship in the 90s. Right? Styles make fights. I think Mike Tyson of the late 80s is an all-time great. Right? I think he would have had a shot on Ali simply because Ali had a problem with exactly quick, small, heavy-handed guys like Mike Tyson. Right? And also guys who could play games with space. The Jimmy Young fight I've mentioned a few times here online. I also feel that George Foreman, better than advertised, would not be intimidated by Mike Tyson trying to jump in on him. Had the kind of defense where he could relax while Tyson tried to jump in on him. Understand, Foreman, huge guy compared to Tyson, would have a half a foot height advantage, right? And Foreman was a guy who's hard to hit in the head. So just food for thought. Also, don't confuse older Foreman. Foreman's savvy when he's older, right? But he wasn't as athletic as he was when he beat Ken Norton after destroying George uh, Joe, Joe Fraser. Anyway, that's how I see it. Let me hear from you the analog fight to Lennox Lewis against Vitaly Klitschko, right? Both referential point champions, right? Guys who you look at and you say, oh, yeah, these guys were great fighters. Is Mike Tyson, Larry Holmes, Larry's past his prime, 38. I know Lewis is 37 when he fights uh, Klitschko. But Lewis is closer to his prime at 37 than Larry Holmes was at 38 after a year and a half out of the ring and two consecutive losses. Right? But just, you know, you see what made Larry great. Just by the fact that when Mike Tyson charges in on him, Larry is calm. <laughs> Larry doesn't try to run. Larry just ties him up. Larry makes it look effortless. Right. Also, you notice in the first four rounds, every round, Larry's trying a different style. Right. Larry was a vet. Larry was elite. Right. That's an interesting fight. Anyway, that's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.